Evening El Paso, welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where we ask the big questions. Today, I feel very grateful to be here interviewing none other than the one and only Professor Bob Farrell, whom I've known since I was a young grasshopper. I first met Professor Farrell in 1994 in his introduction to philosophy class at UTEP, where I was a biology major on my way to medical school. He ruined my life. He lent me one of his books from his library, Friedrich Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy and the Case of Wagner. And uh, yeah, so yeah, you lent it to me from your library down there, there in the basement, you know, your, and I never returned it, but I'll get you a new copy because this one's I've written on. I felt like I was, you know, hit over the head with a hammer, but more like a three by five by Nietzsche changed my major. I fell in love with philosophy and uh, 27 years later, almost 30 years to me, like I was doing the math yesterday and yeah. But so yeah, so these days I have the very good fortune of working with Professor Farrell here at EPCC and today I have the opportunity to ask him a few questions. Professor Farrell obtained his BA in history from North Texas State University, now UNT, in 1965 his MA from UTEP in 1988. He taught for a number of years at the Second Medical University in Shanghai, China, and he collaborated with NASA, with the NASA program at Texas Western University when he was still Texas Western University. One of his side gigs was aligning electron mic microscopes at the University of California, Berkeley. And although initially scientifically oriented, he was he has also been influenced by French poetry and free-form jazz. His major interest is Eastern philosophy and such subtopics as Chinese traditional medicine and Ayurveda Indian medicine. And I would like to add about Bob Farrell that I met him when we were both adjuncts at UTEP teaching philosophy there in the uh, late 90s. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, having my office, when I finally got one, across the hall from Bob uh, in the basement of Worrell Hall, the philosophy building. Uh, we shared many interesting conversations, many dialogues, uh, in between uh, him playing his guitar. And uh, Anyway, I'm happy you're here, Bob. Me too. Thank you. We have a few questions for you today. The first question is, what is philosophy? Well, that's a good question. Do you want the one sentence answer or the yes, semester answer? Okay. <laughs> the one I, sentence. I go with William James in saying it's the unusually stubborn attempt to think clearly. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> that pretty much says it all, but not quite the answer a lot of people want. It's actually uh, it's developed beginning in uh, ancient 6th century Greece, 6th century BC Greece, when they, they started to change from their mythopoetic view. Uh, a, a kind of uh, just so stories told by the uh, old, old, old folks to uh, rational thinking, mm -hmm. particularly when a, a, a prediction of the weather turned out to be accurate, they uh, started looking at r the role of reason. And this has developed over the years. At first, they were looking for the substance that explained everything. Mm -hmm. Then later for a method as si science began to be more uh, pronounced. And then finally, uh, looking at a uh, linguistic turn and uh, recognizing that they have to understand language to, to understand what people are talking about. And this became more problematic. And more recently, they're looking at a meaning, meaning of life and letting the, mm. the uh, religious and scientific people look for the truth. And so um, this has been the development. It's, it's constantly develop, developing. In my lifetime, it, there was a kind of um, civil war between the analytics and the continental. And um, you chose your sides and your, your ideology showed and your perspective pretty much in which one you liked best. And so I I was <laughs> trying to be on both sides of the fence on that one and to, in order to be objective. And so that's where we are today. <laughs> okay. Just thinking about what you said about choosing sides between analytic or continental philosophy, um, I think I think about that a little bit differently. I feel like I was called to philosophy. I feel, I'm sorry. I feel like I was called to philosophy. I feel like it was a vocation. <laughs> like there was something that called me. And so I got called to do philosophy in a certain way. You know, and so 
how, how you personally did you just sit down one day and decide I'm going to do both kinds of philosophy, analytic and phenomena and uh, continental, or how did you come to, to practice philosophy? How did you come to be a philosopher? Oh, yeah. Well, I wasn't originally when I started college. I was a math major because I thought that was the queen of 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 a discipline, and you could you could do that. You could do anything else as well. And I found philosophy boring. Mostly, it was just analytic back in the fifties, and uh, and you could still see Bertrand Russell on television, <laughs> but he wasn't talking about numbers. He was talking about atomic bomb that he wanted mm -hmm. to banish it. And so this was my orientation. I already thought well, a formal philosophy was just boring. It was about as bad as a mathematician. It was just uh, completing a system, like learning to play bridge or something. Mm -hmm. That I, I was more interested in some things like uh, what what caused the Great Depression and are we going to keep having them every few years? Mm -hmm. And who won World War II, if anybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did we win it or did the Russians? And, uh, yeah, those are the big questions that we're having yeah, fun asking, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm going. We're not fine. And so I measured in history, and I found out they don't give you the answer either. Yeah. They give you what they the winners write history. We all know that. And so I, I really wasn't interested in that. I, and philosophy had changed. It, it, uh, they started they introducing the, uh, existentialism into philosophy. And by that time, I was in the Navy. I had uh, been I had joined the Navy Reserve as soon as getting out of high school, and then they took. They called me and told me, you're going out to sea. And I go, no, I got plans. They go, no, you don't. You're going out to sea. So while I was out to sea, I read a lot of philosophy. And uh -huh. it, got, it, it, it was getting better. But, um, so what kind, of, what kind of books did you read when you were out to sea? Did you read oh, existentialist books? I read Sartre books? and Camus. Oh, I would okay. have read uh, Merleau-Ponty and Berdyaev if I... If the bookstores had had them, but I... Uh, I, yeah. I, I well, Sartre and Camus were popular then because they wrote novels, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we were reading Dostoevsky, really, oh, yeah. and uh, cool. and this is how I got into it. I, I hadn't finished. <laughs> the, uh, I never got to the important, important part, but we were reading Dostoevsky, and we'd read almost all of it. We left his last book because we felt if we read everything he wrote, we'd be killing him again. And so, <laughs> so we left him, left him in the quandary. But That's something um, hanging. Right. I was on the flagship of the Second Fleet, and we surrounded Cuba. And so uh, a lot of my shipmates started reading Karl Marx. They were interested in know your enemy and know yourself, and you'll win every time. And so they, and uh -huh. they lent me this book. And so uh, I was able to understand Hegel uh, by realizing that uh, Marx was Hegelian. His, uh, his logic was the dialectic logic of Hegel. So he rejected Hegel's metaphysics, but he accepted his, his logic, and this logic was the, uh, prevailing in the West. And so I, I knew about it. Then, 20 years later, I was working in the physical plant as a carpenter at UTEP, and our secretary was taking Dr. David Lynn Hall's class, uh, <clears throat> intro class, and she was not real clear on Hegel. And so I started talking, and before you knew it, uh, I was her tutor, and then she told Dr. Hall, and, and Dr. Hall uh, wanted to interview me, and he invited me into the program. Mm -hmm. So that's, I kind of slipped in the back door with, with, with good old... My Hegel, baby. Hegel on your on your hip hip pocket, right? Hegel in your hip pocket, right? That's fantastic. What a fantastic story! Yeah. So um, you actually got in, introduced uh, to philosophy on the battlefield. On the what? On, on the, the battlefield. battlefield. Exactly. You yeah. were like, I was going to say go. because right. of the Hazelwood Act, I was able to get my master's and ultimately because of the military I was able to get finally get a good job. Yeah, that's that's a really position, I better say. That's a <laughs> that's a fascinating story, so well. I have another question that's related to this, Bob. Do you think that one is a philosopher or does one become a philosopher? It's like Ornette Coleman said about musicians. Everybody's a musician, just some of them practice more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the same with philosophy. Uh, everybody is well, I think philosophy is, is your your motivation is primarily curiosity. You want to know what's what's really going on, and so you want you try to get to the bottom of it, and mm -hmm. you never do. We find out mm -hmm. as professional philosophers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is learning. no bottom. Keep trying. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's that was my next question. What makes a philosopher? So you just keep wondering why. You yeah, know, what's going and on? And this is what Dr. Springer said. It, he got it from Aristotle. Philosophy is wonder. You wonder what, 
what's what's much really real and true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, um, so but you know, uh, in that regard, you know, um, you said everybody's a philosopher. Only those who practice um, are they better philosophers? Is that Ooh, what, is that what it is? Sometimes not. I would say there's uh, one at Berkeley that I've never been able to stand, and. Uh, <laughs> And yeah. he's very well thought of by everybody but me. Yeah. I won't say his name, but I, a lot of people know know who he is. How do you make a How do you make a distinction then between um, people who practice less and people who practice more? Is that what happens when you become a professional philosopher? Well, you just, then you're you're, you're, you're a teacher. All right. Oh, okay. And the same with musicians; they're not playing anymore. And they say, if you can't play, good teach. And that's not the same for philosophers. But a lot of us that are teaching yeah. philosophy aren't really practicing, we're not writing books like, or uh, 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 giving speeches and stuff. Some of the better ones are, but some people like me, I haven't written any books. Although Dr. Stafford keeps telling me I better write a biography before I forget it. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so that, I don't know if that answers it adequately. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, so practicing, everybody- Yeah, practicing philosophy then for you is doing what professional philosophers do. They give talks. I wanted to make that distinction. Yeah, we give talks, write books. I teach analytic, even though I really am bored by it. Whereas in my own, I'm more interested in Asian philosophy, which they don't want to hear about. Mm -hmm. And so so I have to live two lives. I I do my professional uh, trying to be objective, teaching uh, 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 citizens to be better better citizens citizens with philosophy. And then at home, I do, do my own thing. So that leads me to my next question. Are there different ways to do philosophy? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, we already brought it up with the difference of and the analytics won't get the, uh, get the uh, uh, respect that scientists get. And was the uh, continentals are, are more interested in aesthetics, liter- especially literature. And so, uh, for instance, Camus, he only wrote uh, plays and, and short mm-hmm. stories and stuff. And although he did write some f- philosophy, but uh, theoretic, but he not as not as not so much like Sartre. They were like day and night. So there's and then of course there's all sorts of different. Like one of the ones that I like best was it's called process philosophy. And I never find it in any textbook. And Dr. Springer had uh, the uh, 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 embodied consciousness. He didn't himself even uh, re- relate to that designation, but or he hadn't read, read any. Uh, George Lakoff and uh, the people that talk about embodied consciousness, but there are all sorts of other, other kinds of philosophy besides just uh, analytic. <laughs> just yeah. And so horrible. and so. Well, just let me just add uh-huh. this one thing. So you've mentioned Bill Springer and David Hall. Um, you got drawn into philosophy through David Hall, and then Bill Springer also uh, stimulated your curiosity. They were colleagues of yours at UTEP. Uh-huh. So they, they were part of the department. Uh, both, both of them passed away. A lot of people thought I was a clone to Dr. Hall, but uh, in fact, yeah. he just got me into the program and then Springer helped me uh, st- learn, start teaching. But I was more influenced by Dr. Haddox than anyone. Mm-hmm. And that's oh why God. I wrote on Vasconcelos for my master's. And then also as far as philosophy of science, uh, Dr. Robinson was very influential. And you were very influential uh, mm-hmm. as, quite as well. With, your your classes on Hegel, and and its others. Yeah, Maybe. so I, I I have a little story to tell about that, Bob. So I, I was going to wait till towards the end, but now that you brought it up, um, I remember the day when I was first teaching Jewish philosophy, and I taught Levinas, and mm. you came and visited my class, <laughs> and you said, you said to me, you know, I just can't. And scratching your head, you said, I just can't make out what you know Levinas means by alterity and ipsaity and what are all these words mean you know <laughs> and you challenged me you know because I was fumbling myself with figuring out what the other means for for Levinas and what otherness is all about and so it drove me you know drove my own research interests uh, a little more because of the good questions you raised and well, so I appreciate you. that yeah. I remember that day you came in the class and sat in the class Said you wanted to learn about that because you had these. You were well, curious. Dr. Springer didn't know what it meant, yeah. <laughs> and he didn't do much care. So <laughs> uh, that's good. We we challenge each other, and, no, and I think uh, that's 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 the good part about getting into dialogues in philosophy, right? 
I want to come back though. Know, can, can I just backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. also because you said all these people influenced you. You know, and, and our question was how did you come into philosophy and you told us about the battlefield and Hegel and Marx and then David Hall inviting you into the program, right? And so both of us, I mean, although, you know, you align him with Nietzsche, right, and, and the book well, that he Well, he, he pulled out, because of my issues that I was having at the time, he's like, you know, you might enjoy reading this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your 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 my best friend is your best enemy. <laughs> my existential issues I was having at yeah. the time. But what I wanted to say about you coming into philosophy, um, and th this leads into the next question about truth and is one more right than the other? And you know, I've always associated you with Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, Kim mentioned your your time in in uh, in China. Uh, your your passion for Ayurvedic and all that kind of stuff. So how did, how did you, you know, get so passionate about Chinese philosophy? And, we, and, and is there one kind of Chinese philosophy that you're more passionate about than another? I mean, Taoism versus this Chinese Buddhism. This is a Buddhism. complex question. It's a complex question, Bob, but you've been, you've been um, thinking about that for three or four decades, late, right? To be adequate. Uh, go, but well, I'll start with, it. I was always interested in it because when I graduated high school, I was given a, a present, and it was On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Oh, and so I, I saw his interest, as well as um, uh, the beat poets, in, uh, in uh, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. Right. And particularly Zen Buddhism. But uh, uh, I was interested in a little bit, but didn't think that much about it. It was just something those beatniks like. And then while I was in the Navy, the book came out by Paul Reps called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know it. Mm -hmm. You all know that mm -hmm. it's a little book, and mm -hmm. he mixes up Taoism with with mm -hmm. Buddhism. Right, and, and uh, it's uh, I I didn't realize it at the time, and I thought it was all the same old stuff. And there's this guy David Hinton today, who's very mm -hmm. famous for pointing out that, um, that when Buddhism came to China, the Mahayana uh, turn of the wheel, cosmic wheel, he, um, it didn't have any words for uh, a lot of the concepts, so they had to use Taoist terms. So Zen Buddhism was actually Taoism in disguise, <laughs> and it, it uh, was a kind of mixture, mm -hmm. the two of them together. And so um, I, I read that, and I got more and more interested in it. Mm -hmm. Then I, I, I became friends with the acupuncture doctor in El Paso at the time, doc, um, Dr. Chris Butler, who moved away to, right away to, San, to Austin and ultimately Santa Fe. And uh, uh, he got me interested in acupuncture and Chinese traditional medicine. So then when I went to China uh, to, to teach, I only taught one year over there, actually, <laughs> so to make it accurate. Uh, uh, while I was teaching there, I, I uh, got involved even more, not just with uh, Chinese traditional medicine, but with uh, 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 the martial arts, mm -hmm. particularly Qigong. And so uh, my interest continued. And then when I came back to UTEP, uh, Dr. Hall was writing books on Confucius. So there's some basic differences. Dr. Hall was a scholar, and he was more interested in Confucius, whereas I like the Taoists, right? And so, and he didn't realize it. And then he and um, Ames began to write on Taoism as well towards mm -hmm. the end of their uh, of his his career. Mm -hmm. So it just continued on and on. But I wasn't actually influenced by Hall. I, it was just I was already interested, and then he just helped me uh, continue. And he was real more famous for his interest in uh, Derrida, and then they got in, they got interested themselves. He and uh, Ames mm -hmm. later on after they had been into postmodern and, and poststructuralism, and so it was just one of those things that happened. It was a time and place situation. Oh, that's so interesting. You know, I I I actually I thought I didn't know that part of your background very well. I thought you had been influenced by David Hall. And Actually, he didn't influence me. He was, he yeah. was a Confucian, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, as we know, the the the, the Daoists make fun of Confucians right. all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, this this. So, there were affinities, though. I mean, they're, 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 in in general, the Chinese um, Chinese philosophical traditions. Um, you know, there are conflicts with them. But in some ways, China, uh, this is how I learned Chinese philosophy, they, they identify with them on multiple different levels. Right. right? They, they 
have yeah, this kind it's of just mixed, like yoga mixed of package. India. It, you can see it as stretching and exercise, or you can see preparing your body for spiritual uh, uh, right. in, in advancement. Right. Do you think that there's so you identify more with a Taoist? Oh, definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And but do you think that there's one school? Chinese or European or American that is closer to the truth or closer to reality? Oh yeah, just with, like when yeah. they, their economics they say socialism with a Chinese uh, characteristic or something like that. That uh, in fact, Hall went to China and he asked them, is this a, a, a Confucian uh, temple or a Taoist? And they didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. That they were, they were Confucians while they were in office and then mm -hmm. when they retired, they headed for the mountains, drank wine and wrote poetry. <laughs> weren't Confucians anymore, but they still could be if they had to. So in other words, right, they're that was like... The, that was the point I was making. Is yeah, that you could, you, they're like Walt Whitman. They, they, yeah. in, there are many... <laughs> you take on different many faces. Many contradictions. You take on different faces depending upon the context you're in, right? So if yeah. you have a social function... Situation, they're, they're more pragmatic than anybody. Uh, right. <laughs> And right. uh, and Bob, why why do you identify with the Taoist mo the most? Why do I? Mm -hmm. Why what about Taoism? Well, I don't know. They drink wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you no, know, it fits in more with. Uh, I'm interested in the, um, the medicine and the health aspects. And I was going to say this is what I I see philosophy instead of worrying about same sex marriage and and immigration, and they should be worrying about the global warming and the, their health, that the food is not even edible, mm -hmm. and that we should be trying to be more healthy and then letting the other stuff take care of itself. So that's my my intention, is that philosophy should be worried about these more important things. And if, if it's just, for, for instance, from Dr. Um, Robinson, I got the philosophy of food. And they, and a lot of people are saying this is not philosophy. I go more more's the pity. <laughs> this is what we should be thinking about. Even William Burroughs with Naked Lunch. We should be looking at what we're eating. Well, you you said you uh, in your background you got a degree from University of North Texas, right? Mm -hmm. well, from UTEP. No, but from um, you uh, and well, no, uh, it was, I, it was called North was Texas. North Texas State, but now it's the University of North Texas. Okay, so, so oh, is it part of the system? I, I didn't even realize. It. <laughs> it's uh, University of North Texas. I think it's its own system, so it has some satellite schools. But they have in their philosophy department, they have a program called Philosophy of Food. Oh, they do? This yeah. Thing. I didn't um, even know that. Yeah, they yeah, had a yeah. jazz program. That's the reason I went up there. Yeah, we have uh, one of our, our graduate students from our program, um, at, from UTEP's program, went there to, to study philosophy and music because of their, their, they still have a very strong music program. I would like to ask you for, you know, for the sake of our viewers, how is Chinese philosophy? And even, you know, we're characterizing Chinese philosophy from from the outside, right? So we're painting it with big brush strokes. But generally, how is Chinese philosophy different than Western philosophy? Well, I, I can say individual ways and in overall that uh, they, Chinese philosophy went right away to ethics, mm -hmm. whereas Western philosophy started with metaphysics and still is. The science is still looking at atoms and stuff. And didn't, and in fact, the, um, the idea of uh, free will conflicts with the idea of, uh, of atomism. And then it went to uh, epistemology, worrying about method and getting involved in science, and, and uh, finally ended up in dead ends that science invents atomic bombs but doesn't cure the common cold. And so we have ethical problems, and it finally ends up with dead ends in ethics. You got Bertrand Russell ending up where, uh, protesting the atomic bomb, not talking about numbers anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then it offered North Whitehead going on with process philosophy as well. Uh, whereas Confucius went right to ethics, and when they asked him about the afterlife, he said, you don't even know how to live this life, and you already want the afterlife. <laughs> Better mm -hmm. just get right. And so uh, there's that difference, that they're interested in ethics and, and okay. social problems more than the, uh, mechanical problems. And, but yet, at the same time, China's changed. They're they're high tech. I rode the maglev train many years ago already, and it was going 300 miles an hour and not using a drop of oil. So uh, uh, high tech is <laughs> is there and uh, and continue to go. 
but like on the um, smaller scale, uh, the, the Western world rejects the concept of vi uh, vitalism. It a adamantly rejects the concept of vitalism. What is vitalism? Vital energy. Mm -hmm. the They're saying there, that there's no such thing. It was a, it was a mistake, and then we've gotten over that now. We know that everything is just new, uh, <laughs> uh, new, neutral matter. <laughs> and they're sticking with it. That's their story. They're mm -hmm. sticking with it. But in fact, I, I can feel the vital energy. You can too. Mm -hmm. if you, and, <clears throat> and that's what uh, Chinese traditional medicine with, uh, is part of it. And a lot of people don't realize that's only a part of it. That there's also nutrition. There's rest. and uh, 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 Cough drop. Oh, good. Thank you. No problem. <clears throat> and while you do that, I'll sound smart and... Um, Talk about the Buddha. The Buddha. This is the story. The story goes that um, you know the Buddha stayed away from talking about metaphysics, and instead said, you know, this is what you need to do, like prescribing. Um, well, they have their metaphysics. Everybody does. Yeah. It's, it's naturalism. Sure. They're trying to be instead of trying to conquer nature, and this was another answer to your previous question. They're trying to be natural and be as close to nature as possible. And not try to conquer it because that's a uh, kind of losing battle. <laughs> and, but that was one of the things that he said. He said, <laughs> <laughs> "We philosophers." You did this well. on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I really didn't. <laughs> and your your <laughs> mouth is going to turn purple. <laughs> I'm going to have to turn goat here and just eat the paper. <laughs> Um, you're getting, you're getting it. You're yeah. getting it. <laughs> Carol's going to have I'll have to, next time, I'll have to <laughs> uh, unwrap the cough chops and rewrap them. <laughs> it's one of those, like, practical jokes, and now your mouth is turning purple, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, let's no. wait, wait, let's, let me yeah. get my composure. Yeah, <laughs> but the point, the point was like somebody approached them, you know, with like uh, an issue that he was going through. And uh, he's, he told them, you know, this is what you need to do. And, you know, he probably prescribed meditation or something along those lines. And he said, um, instead of asking all those questions, you know, all the metaphysical questions, it would be like, do you want me to take the arrow out that you've been struck by? Or should we find out what kind of wood it was? <laughs> yeah, who, who made who this made arrow? Who made it, yeah. you know, yeah, that's a and good one. who brought it here? And because that's the metaphysics as, yeah, as opposed the, to alleviating the immediate pain. That's what I was trying to say. Right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, so. Um, what? Well, that, that was my intention, <laughs> passing on the cough drop. <laughs> <laughs> alleviating the pain. Yeah. What books in Chinese philosophy do you recommend for for people who might be interested in Chinese well, oh, philosophy? Well, of course, Dr. Hall's books, <laughs> Dr. Hall and Ames' books, especially his later, well, all, all of his books on Confucius, as well as his later books on Taoism, I find to be very well done. And Dr. Ames uh, is, is a well-known expert, and, so, and Hall is the best philosopher of the two. Well, I better not say that. He might hear me. <laughs> I'd see that. But uh, he, that was more his field, whereas Ames was good with language, although he is a philosopher as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Hall didn't know Chinese that well, so they worked well together. But those books especially. And then Zhuangzi, and uh, this is the, uh, the philosophic Taoism uh, rather than the religious or, mm -hmm. uh, or metaphysical Taoism. <laughs> uh, that, and then, of course, the Tao Te Ching um, of Lao Tzu, so all of those, and then there's a lot, a lot of um, <laughs> of Taoist works besides those. And, and you, you'll get if you get started with these ones I just mentioned, you'll mm -hmm. you'll find the other ones easily. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite story from the book of Zhuangzi? Yeah, which the one? Two monks were walking along and they ran into a, a woman, and she wanted to cross the river and couldn't. So the one monk picked her up and carried her across the river, and then when they got to the other side, the one monk said to him. You picked up a, you touched a woman there. What's wrong with you? He said, "Yeah, but I put her down. You didn't." Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, "You've heard that one yeah. before." Yeah, that's that's one that I like. <laughs> I like. Uh, I I forget exactly how the story goes, but well, I like Cook Ding, the butcher. 
The you like what? Cook Ding, the butcher, the dexterous butcher. Mm -hmm. The one that um, that says, you know, when I first began cutting the oxes, he would just chop them because he didn't know how to cut. But he got so good at doing what he did that he never um, he never touched any bone. He knew exactly where to, where to cut. Oh, okay. The, cook the, bu thing uh, one, the butcher. The dexterous uh, butcher. But I also like the other one where he says, um, somebody, somebody, uh, you know, uh, some official, some government official came in, the story goes, and um, asked Chuangsa if he would be willing to consider holding office. And Chuangsa says something to the effect of, um, I don't remember exactly, but... No, it will. It's a turtle story. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I would rather be a turtle, uh, you know, just like dragging my tail in the mud <laughs> than be there. <laughs> Does that have overtones or anything? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So it, all the stories in there are, are equally uh, persuasive. Yeah. For, for your, this kind of thinking, so. Great. Yeah, I'll show my knowledge or ignorance. The oh. one story I recall is how do you uh, um, f uh, philosophizing is like cooking a small fish yeah, that yeah. that's Taoism that's, uh, that's the Taoist yeah that oh, was Lao Tzu that's not Lao Tzu that's okay now uh, I said I showed my ignorance or my <laughs> <laughs> all right go ahead well ruling a country is like cooking a small fish okay uh, a small fish mm -hmm. as far as books that you mentioned I would say all the translations by Red Pine yeah. He's actually an American, but he, that's his Chinese name, Red Pine. And he has some really good translations, and he's done a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So, I have one. I have yet to read it, though. It's sitting in my bookshelf looking pretty. He translated um, the Heart Sutra, I think. Yeah, I have that, mm -hmm. too. But he also got into the, all, all the ancient poets, and I learned something from it. The ancient Chinese you, uh, put uh, turmeric in their wine, mm. and... Uh, I told Dr. Stafford, I'm, I've, he likes um, yellow wine. I said, it, it won't work with red wine, but with yellow wine, I put turmeric, and then turmeric doesn't do any good fighting infl inflammation unless you put uh, freshly ground black pepper in with it. And Dr. Stafford said, you've certainly ruined a good drink, haven't you? And <laughs> in fact, it tastes real good to me. Okay, we'll it's have a, to try. It amazed me. And so I learned it from, the, from Red Pine's translation of the ancient poets. <laughs> so you can get philosophies many ways besides mm -hmm. yeah white wine turmeric and black pepper that's an we'll have to try it right <laughs> Bob can you please tell us about your current projects uh, my, what are you working on these days mm -hmm. yeah I have an ongoing project I'm, and I learned from you you got your, um, you got a mini grant I'm gonna get, later on try to get a mini grant interviewing a retired uh, IT person from UTEP and he's a, a longtime friend of mine, and, and I'm going to interview him about uh, creating a logic course in which you, uh, which you learn to, to uh, write program, mm -hmm. write uh, Python, in fact. And so that and mm -hmm. not, not yeah, is not uh, and are, you know, that you can translate that to an if program, an if uh, circuit that gives you an, an answer. And so, in other words, try to create interest in logic, which I had none. <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, and see that it has uses, that you can go right into programming and it'll, it's, it'll be a lot easier to learn how to write code. Uh, it's, you're already logical and you've already been through that. Does that sound good? That sounds good. And what about this books? Can you tell us a little bit about this projects that you have okay, going on? Then this is another one. Any members of the, of the, of the program uh, are interested in bringing um, uh, uh, southwestern philosophy into the, to the especially Mina Goldman. That she, they, in fact, she, she's written books about how to, to have a southwestern um, uh, introduction. And I, of course, was already for that and, <laughs> and been reading um, Carlos Castaneda, but uh, Dr. Haddock's interested me because of mm -hmm. a book he and his wife Road called Vasconcelos, mm -hmm. and so I carried on with that. In fact, writing, uh, translating it for my master's degree, and I was uh, was interested in the program, not so much his his life story, which turned out sadly, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. that was my original interest. And then I found out that my interest in 
Chinese traditional medicine overlaps with curanderismo, yeah. um, which is l widely seen as witch doctor, but it should be uh, uh, native health, native medicine. And so the, uh, the, this man has already uh, been teaching a course at UNM in, uh, in Southwestern medicine. His name is Chio uh, Torres, and he taught it uh, in the, down near uh, Brownsville. What's the name of that uh, college that's there? You, now it's called uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Oh, really? Mm. Okay. It was he, UTPA before. I used to teach there. Americana or something. Like that. Pan American. Pan America, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was teaching there, and then he moved to, um, to Albuquerque to UNM and created a course in healing. Um, with um, southwestern culture, and so I even took took them on sabbatical into central Mexico to to meet some real carnero. Mm -hmm. And so I show this movie called uh, uh, Ethics in America, and you see a current uh, a lady carnera, and she's saying, five hundred years ago they had burnt me at the stake for doing this, mm -hmm. but now it's coming back." <laughs> And so it's it's kind of coming back, and so I'm I'm anxious to to help it. <laughs> so what are the how are they how are they the same? How is Ayurveda? Um, how is curanderismo? Or herbs, herbs. Okay. Like my uh, my I, my ex-wife would take a cone, when I had an earache, she'd take a cone, a paper made into a cone, and then light her a cigarette lighter, and it would create a vacuum, and it would suck that um, the inflammation out. Everybody seems to know that, and it's just regular um, native medicine, native thinking. But my little brother learned from a, uh, an Indian in Colorado where he lived um, to use Osha. It's considered a weed. There's even a trail up uh, near near Cockroft called the Osha Trail. And um, well, anyway, it's considered a weed, but it, it fights uh, inflammation and it's good for colds and flu. And so I've been using OSHA for 20 years. And when I, somebody tells me they have a cold, I tell them, take OSHA. And they look at me like I'm sn selling snake oil. Like, what are, <laughs> are you crazy? I want, some, I want some medicine. I want a pill. <laughs> so. Why do you think this type of thinking and this type of healing is, well, I mean, it's making a comeback. But for a long time, it was seen as snake oil or Oh, they saw it as uh, work of the devil. That's why they call them witch doctors. They, mm -hmm. they, they considered it not, not, <laughs> not really Christian to be acting that way. And so, Do you think that there's some uh, parallels between um, traditional Western philosophy um, and the way that traditional Western philosophy deems other types of philosophy as not legitimate types of philosophy? I do. It, it's an economic and political uh, situation of uh, 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 self-interest. Now, even snake oil. In Chinese traditional medicine, uh, s s uh, snake is good medicine, especially snake bile. Yeah, they, <laughs> it's used to cure you. So when they say snake oil, this is just a, a kill-all term right. to make them sound evil and, and uh, and wrong, but in fact, it, it goes back. I'm pretty sure that the the first people that came to America was would wouldn't even survive. But uh, Guanajuato or whatever his name is uh, helped them learn to plant corn and and uh, and survive. I'm sure they helped them with um, tr um, herbal medicine as well and and uh, in traditional healing in, in terms of tradition, meaning um, Native American. And this, of course, combined with Mexicans and uh, uh, also all those people that were in, in the Southwest. Why do you think it's making a comeback? Well, I'm not really sure it is, but mm -hmm. it, it, we have him teaching and uh, and trying. <laughs> and, um, even acupuncture is, is having a hard time. Even in uh, what is it called the um, the Journal of American Medicine, they had some people saying that it just sticking needle in them anywhere works, mm -hmm. and it. It's really not true. It's not a very good test, and it's not not good science. But uh, so traditional uh, traditions in economics 
uh, try to hang on to their power. And so it's trying to make a comeback. We'll see if it does or not. But it, it's much it's garnered much more interest lately than it had in, uh, years in years past. I don't know if this is related, but and and I'm not exactly sure um, how to even put the question. But speaking of calling somebody a witch doctor or someone saying you're not practicing philosophy, you don't. You it's don't not real philosophy. You don't fit the name of a, what's called a philosopher. Uh, I was looking up some, you know, how your name popped up on the internet, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and I came across an article about rectification of names. And was that by you? What's the name of it? Rectification of names. That, yeah, Joel and, Joel and I wrote that. Right. And it was actually about Confucius. Right. And he was saying that uh, if he had power, that's what he, the first thing he would do. And he was taking it from the Yellow Emperor that re rectified the... The wagon tracks, so that it wouldn't. So when they had mud, it wouldn't wreck the carriages. Mm -hmm. It was making it uh, rational uh, by rectifying the the sizes. So that rectification was uh, occurred to Confucius too. He said, if, if we knew what words meant exactly, and of course this right away has overtones with Wittgenstein, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, we, we wouldn't have these problems when people started talking about freedom. They know that that didn't mean breaking into the White House or the, the Capitol. That, that that's not freedom. That's treason. So if we had these words, we knew exactly what they mean, right. then we wouldn't uh, wouldn't have many of the social problems. When I brought it up last night, we were preparing for our di our dialogue with you today, um, and she said, "Well, what is that?" So I was trying to explain it, and I said, "Well, maybe we just better let." <laughs> let you explain Let me it. do it. <laughs> yeah, because I think it had to do for Confucius. I said, I learned it a long time ago, but it, you know, it's not something I, you know, it's so present to me. And, and, you, and you published that article just recently, actually, like six, five or six years ago. Yeah. Speaking no, we published relatively three. Recently. And then I published another one. And they were all based on Habermas, really. Right. Then, yeah, I saw Habermas's name was appended mm -hmm. to that. And, and then I, I published one that was uh, called... Um, um, uh, uh, <laughs> the noble lie, and I'm, I was uh, uh, dealing with that that problem of uh, uh, that Habermas probably wouldn't work with, in, in a world where uh, nobody knew what to believe because there's so many noble lies floating around. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so actually, it comes <coughs> back to a question of Confucian ethics, right? So, if the way I understand the rectification of names is, you hold an office. Or you you hold a title, or you you're a, you have the name of a certain role in society, like father, mm -hmm. right? And you have to live up to that name. What it really means well, that, to be a father. Well, that's essential Confucianism too. Right. And that's even Hindu enlightenment. That when you realize that you're divine as well, you're made by the divinity, then you have to live up to it. <laughs> Are you? Because you realize it's it's true. You're you're part of any divinity that is. And so, if you don't live up to it, you're uh, you're, you're you're not really you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I liked your thesis in the article, though. The little I didn't read the whole thing through because um, it was late when I found it. But it was that we wouldn't have this kind of political stalemate. You said if, in fact, people were living up to their names of being govern, you know, yeah, governing officials who exactly. who, who governed according like Ted to Ted Cruz. We're we're freezing, and he had, well, I shouldn't actually name up. Politicians, maybe we want to edit it there. But <laughs> he's an example that comes to mind immediately. That they're yeah. not even thinking about uh, the, the the people in general. They're just thinking about them own, their own selves and their and their self interest. Yeah, so this right. they're not living up to their job title qualification yeah. specification. To be a true king or a true emperor, a true senator is mm -hmm. to serve the people, right? Yeah, something along those lines. I mean, that's the Confucian ethics. It's that yeah. preserving the social order. Well, I'm sure this is what happened to him. The one job he had, someone gave a bunch of horses and dancing girls to the, to the, to the emperor or to the head of that state. Right. And he said, I, I'm fired. I can tell already. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, but to come back to, I, I mean, so to come back to the, uh, the part of our conversation where you said, well, you know, there's, Conf you know, Dr. Hall and Confucius, David Hall and Confucius ethic, Confucianism, and 
your love and passion for Taoism, and there are two very different ways to practice philosophy. Exactly. But nonetheless, you still embrace. We were this buddies, part of, even. Yeah, but nonetheless, you still embrace this Confucianism enough to write about it and value it. Um, so oh, that's yeah. an interesting, well, that's an interesting because I, practice, right? I see the Chinese; they can even uh, even incorporate Christianity and communism. They see Jesus as kind of got it like poor people and stuff. <laughs> And what are the Taoist ethics in comparison to the Confucian that we've been talking about? Oh, very nice. Okay, yeah, the Confucians question. want to change society and think, feel that they can make a change uh, uh, dynamically and politically. And the Taoists think that the more you try to change it, the worse it gets. Your best idea is to try to avoid it. Oh, <laughs> That's right. why they go into the mountains and drink wine and write poetry. They don't want to get involved with all these uh, people that are grasping for power. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Embrace the Wu Wai. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And mm -hmm. what is that? It's uh, Galassenheit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> let, what is let that? Let something be, to just let it be, to, yeah. to not try to mix in and, and, and flip the fish too many times. You just kind of have to let it be and let it, you know, cook according to how it should be cooked, which is just very lightly. So it's, it's practicing philosophy with a light touch. It's, ha it's having did a get, plan how B. How did I do? Huh? How did I do? Great. All right. It was thanks. wonderful. It's having a plan B. It's being flexible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what is it that in, uh, yeah, the, like in jazz music, that you're spontaneous? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like and so the interesting thing, though, that you, we have five minutes left, but um, uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, but you mentioned Galassenheit. Um, and so that was that reference to Heidegger. Yeah. So you, I mean, I mean, you have this other whole background that comes out of existentialism yeah. too. I do. Know, that you and I don't reject mix. that at all. Yeah, 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 you you mix and match. You yeah. know, that's that kind of flexibility in the way you practice philosophy, and that's really great, Bob. Well, I really well, you have I, so I much share, to offer. I'm sorry. You have so much to offer. And I really well, appreciate you. that about you as a philosopher that you know how to speak the language of everybody, but you know, but you have your own interests as opposed to being and staying very narrowly in one. I'm not trying to convert them. <laughs> you know. I'm just trying to show them the uh, uh, way I understand things. <laughs> yeah, you can speak with everybody. Everybody can speak with you. So at this, at this point, what we want to do is allow you to ask us questions. Well, we should know, have done that end. earlier, actually. Well, I mean, there's a few minutes yeah, left. Do you have one or two questions you want to ask us <laughs> about this show, mm. about just philosophy well, in general? I, I wasn't. I don't know exactly where to start. What, how did you all meet? <laughs> how did you all oh. get to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question, Bob. Uh, well, I looked them up in the, you know, back then uh, we used to have the, the course printed, catalog. the course catalogs printed. Mm -hmm. Remember? I remember those days. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the class fit my, my time. So I signed up for one of his classes. Yeah, I just kind of fit into her schedule. That's mm. how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I met, I was, it was for modern philosophy, mm. modern philosophy. And, uh, and he was really good looking. He still is. So. Well, he is, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we met. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and even back then, Kim was mm. a standout student. You know, she had mm. her own way of doing things and she well, had her story, and she was sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have this picture of you as, as a kind of Germanic, mm -hmm. uh, that you're interested in uh, Hegel and Nietzsche and uh, the, uh, the Germanic uh, 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 part of, uh, mm -hmm. of continental philosophy. Yeah, mm -hmm. so if I, if I can kind of end our, our time here, or, or at least begin to bring it to a close, to connect with what you've been saying all along it, uh, with respect to Taoism and why you like it so much. So when I was younger, um, I uh, had a choice in high school about which, which language to study, French or German. And so my mother, who had a big influence on me, uh, was convinced that the French teacher didn't know what she was doing. And she said, you have to take German. <laughs> <laughs> so I, st I started studying German as a high school kid. And one of the things we did was take a trip to Germany in my junior year. And 
I went across. To do what? Make to, German just, beer? Just, just to go to Germany for a trip, right? Uh -huh. It was on spring break. And, you know, here I am. I'm not even 18 yet, but drinking age is, is 14 or 16 in Germany. And we get there and we're allowed to drink. So kind of like you and Taoism going up in the mountains drinking wine, I got to drink German beer. Well, you, you, know, and, Bruce, high school you kid. and Bruce Loudon. Yeah, I yeah. got to drink German beer, you know, uh, dancing on the table in the Hofbrau house. You know, I, those are my memories. And so there's something <laughs> good going on here. You know? <laughs> they know something we don't. Yeah, they know something <laughs> we don't, right? Well, I, I did too. I would, came from like Fort Worth where they thought Coors was, was a treasure to bring back from Colorado. And when we were in... Charleston, South Carolina, a German ship came in and they gave us all Koenig's Brawl beer that they got as grog rather than milk like we did in the next. <laughs> yeah. And we go, man, this tastes better than the Budweiser. I'm going to go with that. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I have no, a that, that, was, story. That, was, that was my contribution there to kind of connect with the drinking wine in the mountains by the Taoists, you know, and drinking. Uh, I, I got involved with appreciating German culture and, you know, the German kind of mentality and their disposition. Well, there's even know. a spirituality connected w with fermentation that I've been s studying with this guy. I can't say his name right now. But Brenner or something like that. He's from uh, Las Cruces. No, I'm not Las Cruces, but uh, in the mountains over there, to west of Las Cruces, whatever that's called over there, and uh, Silver City. And uh, uh, talking about the spirituality of fermentation, that it w yeah. went back, that women were the actual brewers in the original day, <laughs> yeah, and in, in other words, there's a long culture there. I'm yeah. like Kavanaugh. I like beer too, but yeah. but uh, I have diabetes too now, and so oh. I stick with wine. And oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, you're still alive and well, and we're glad that you could join us for our dialogue today. Yeah, this is. I'm very happy that we got to speak with you, and hopefully, other your students will watch this and. <laughs> appreciate stay away. you more. <laughs> stay away from philosophy or you he'll he'll ruin your life. <laughs> yeah. Or well, you know, or you know, as as is the case, you know, you've been influential to probably mm -hmm. many students mm -hmm. and help them uh, learn how to philosophize with a hammer, as Nietzsche would say, right? And, uh, well I hope or, so. Or That's or maybe what keeps me in business. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> philosophize like cooking a small fish. I mean there's there's different ways and you, you're able then to teach well, that's a good one. I'm glad you brought that one up. Yeah. I've often wondered what did they really mean by a small fish? You, you cook it with a lower fire or, or put more, more uh, spices in? <laughs> or how do you cook a small fish differently than a large fish? You let it go. You, you, don't, you, you don't leave it mess alone. With it. You, you leave, leave it, alone it alone a little bit. You don't oh, okay. mess with it all. If you keep flipping it, it's just going to fall apart, right? Okay, that's fish. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like the government. <laughs> let things be. Yeah, letting things be. Well, that's a good note to <laughs> slide you an end on. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Well, my pleasure, for sure. Mm -hmm.